Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for being here. It's now been over a month since the first round of storms caused major flooding in central Vermont and the Northeast Kingdom. And I know it's easy to forget about the impacts flooding has had on communities and homeowners if your town wasn't hit. But there are many Vermonters who are still mucking out their homes and trying to figure out how they'll pay bills, where they'll live, and how to move forward from the devastation they've experienced. And towns who couldn't possibly have foreseen the damage of this magnitude are left wondering how they'll be able to afford to make repairs. And some are wondering if they'll be able to make them at all. As of this morning, we haven't received a response on our major disaster declaration request, but if approved, will bring much needed resources and relief to homeowners and municipalities. I've asked Chief Recovery Officer Doug Farnham to talk about some of the work his team is doing in the meantime. I also know many who were impacted and those helping out in the areas that were are starting to feel a sense of fatigue. For many, this is the second year in a row where instead of enjoying the summer, are cleaning up and rebuilding. And like last summer, with multiple storms bringing torrential downpours, there are many who have been at this year's cleanup for weeks. So I want to start by thanking all those across the state for all you're doing to help clean up, repair infrastructure, and help us recover. This includes first responders, town officials and road crews, utility workers, contractors, VTRANS, ANR, our State Emergency Operations Center, Swift Water teams, National Guard members, and many, many more who have stepped up again and again to take care of their communities, often sacrificing time with their families and putting their own safety at risk. There are also an army of volunteers and local organizations like Barry Up, Montpelier Alive, the Lamoille Area Recovery Network, Kingdom United Resilience and Recovery Effort, and many more. We've also seen organizations from out of state come to Vermont to help those impacted. There have been many groups through the Voluntary Organizations Active in Disasters, or VOAD, who have helped out, some for the second summer in a row. Last week, there were seven volunteers who spent the day mucking out a basement and carried out 2,700 buckets of mud, mud and muck, which weighed nearly 45 tons. This is just one of many stories of groups coming together to help out. So I want to thank the Mennonites, Southern Baptists, United Methodists, Red Cross, Team Rubicon, All Hearts and Minds, or All Hot Hearts and Hands, and all the volunteers who have traveled to Vermont and spent their summer volunteering. Their service and strong work ethic is something that I appreciate. If you're looking to volunteer, it's not too late. Get involved with your local recovery group or sign up at volunteer.gov slash volunteer. Vermont, let me do that again, vermont.gov slash volunteer to be connected to a project in need of some help. Lending a hand, whether it's for an hour or an entire day, can really make a difference, and we need you. Those volunteering can't do it on their own. Those in municipal government can't do it on their own. So don't take for granted that someone else will do it. You don't have to wait to be asked. Now is the time to step up, get involved, and help our state recover the Vermont way. I'll now turn it over to Chief Recovery Officer Doug Farnham. Thank you, Governor. I was appointed last August in response to one of the most significant statewide flooding events in Vermont's history. Hundreds of households were still recovering to re struggling to recover from devastating impacts of that flood when parts of the state were hit by the remnants of Hurricane Barrel and then only weeks later by destructive flash flooding. The layering of financial and mental health impacts from these events is real, and dozens of Vermont communities are, have greater need than they can meet with local resources. 
Long-term recovery groups, that, like the governor mentioned, formed by volunteers from across Vermont, have been instrumental in supporting community members, but these floods have strained their already limited capacity. In response, the state has launched two initiatives that I'd like to provide more detail on. The first is to provide additional case management resources to support the work of long-term recovery groups. Just to emphasize there, they have established a structure, those groups, and we're augmenting them, trying to just make sure they have more of what they need. State employees have volunteered from across state government and are currently being trained to provide short-term support to the long-term recovery groups while we evaluate how this summer's flood changes the needs in the next year. These bridge case managers, as we're calling them, will be deployed to increase the capacity of these local long-term recovery groups and the support they can provide to individuals. And as the governor mentioned, when there's a declaration, if there's a declaration, that will change what's available. But I want to emphasize that there, there is help from state and local programs now. And so these case managers are able to resolve some of the cases even before a federal declaration is issued. Second, the $5 million of state funds that was authorized by the Emergency Board is being deployed through a partnership with the Vermont Bond Bank. We're meeting with the hardest hit communities to distribute these funds and know that while the $5 million may help with some of the cash flow needs of municipalities, it will not be enough to close the gap. So we will continue to work with the Vermont Bond Bank and Treasurer Pichek on deploying a second round of lending to keep municipal finances uh, stabilized and ensure that critical work continues to move forward. With that, I'll hand it over to Jason Gosselin from the Agency of Human Services. Thank you, Doug. Good afternoon. My name is Jason Goslin, and I am the Emergency Management Director at the Vermont Agency of Human Services. I am also the Individual Assistance Officer for the State of Vermont. Individual Assistance, which is a FEMA program, is about helping families recover from disaster once a disaster declaration request is approved. Recovery is a long process. It is a phased approach and divided into short-term recovery, intermediate recovery, and long-term recovery. There are many partners in each recovery phase. One thing that is consistent is the value and importance volunteer groups provide in helping families recover. One example of short-term recovery following the July 10th flooding is the support received from the Southern Baptists who provided just under 6,000 meals to communities impacted, as well as having 66 volunteers logging over 900 hours of mucking out homes impacted by the flood. They worked closely with the Salvation Army to deliver the food to the two needed communities. Another organization, as the governor had referenced, is All Hands and Hearts. This is a global disaster relief organization and currently deployed to the Northeast Kingdom to muck out homes that were flooded last month. These are just a few of the many volunteer organizations who have stepped up to support Vermonters, all of which are coordinated through the Volunteer Organizations Active in Disaster, or VOAD. VOAD not only has a national presence, but a Vermont unit consisting of 19 various volunteer organizations that has helped coordinate the volunteer recovery effort. Another, volu uh, another volunteer example is a large gift of cleaning supplies from Lowe's. These supplies were distributed to several impacted communities and provided to families, as well as gift cards for building supplies. The same with UPS and their financial gift, as well as Catholic Charities and their financial gift. Thank you to all these organizations for their support all coordinated through VOAD. These national partners with local chapters are just a couple of the many volunteer organizations that have stepped forward to provide assistance. As I have said before, recovery is a long process. Teams are tired. As we transition from short-term recovery to long-term recovery, volunteering continues to be a need. A combination of trained experienced volunteer relief organizations plus spontaneous volunteers will help communities recover more quickly. 
I'm asking if you have the opportunity to volunteer, here are some ways that you can help. First, the Vermont Disaster Recovery Fund is a nonprofit organization that provides funding to help meet unmet long-term recovery needs of families impacted by disasters, which Holly from the Vermont Community Foundation will talk more about in a moment. Second, 10 long-term recovery groups, all staffed by volunteers, have been established throughout Vermont and are in need of support. Where there is an understanding of assessing construction projects or coordinating local volunteer groups to help families remove debris from their properties, these long-term recovery groups can use your help. Please visit our 2024 flood recovery website at www.vermont.gov backslash flood for a complete listing of these long-term recovery groups. Third, if you are a volunteer organization and interested in becoming more involved in volunteer disaster recovery uh, uh, work, please consider joining uh, the Vermont VOAD group. Information can be found on www dot v t v o a d dot o r g finally speaking of our flood recovery website there is also a section where you can register to become a volunteer please consider volunteering here or through one of the long-term recovery groups and if you aren't able to volunteer please check in on your neighbors ask them how they're doing Bring them a warm meal, because in times like these, what may seem insignificant at the time can in fact have a large impact on those families that are mucking out their homes. Thank you for your time. I'll now turn it over to Holly from the Vermont Community Foundation. Thank you, Jason, Governor, Doug. I'm Holly Morehouse. I'm the Vice President for Community Impact at the Vermont Community Foundation. The Community Foundation exists to help make Vermont's community stronger, both now and well into the future. When the rain and flooding started a year ago, the Community Foundation moved quickly to establish the Vermont Flood Response and Recovery Fund. In 2023, close to $14 million were raised into that fund with donations coming from all across Vermont from every state in the nation and from around the globe. With those generous contributions from over 9,000 individual donors, philanthropic partners, more than 270 businesses, the Community Foundation has been able to move grants and funding to support response and recovery efforts in more than 100 Vermont communities. It is such an important example of what uh, the power and the hope that collective and aligned philanthropic bringing can give to the types of disasters that Vermont has faced and continues to face. And yet here we all are again. I know like many of you, my heart, my heart aches um, for the communities in Vermont um, that have experienced this flooding, that were hit a year ago, that were hit in December, that were hit again in 2024. There's so much work ahead to do. And I'm also proud to be able to share that over the last year, um, donations into the Flood Response and Recovery Fund have done exactly what you would expect and hope that they would do. Getting dollars out quickly, making sure that people have food and water and shelter, helping towns and municipalities with cleanup, with the cost for emergency responders, for volunteer coordination, working with partners to get mental health supports in place for flood survivors and those working with them, supporting watershed resilience projects and funding the bulk purchase of construction materials for home, uh, repairing homes and other properties. And the effectiveness of the flood response and recovery fund here in Vermont has not stopped there. As we moved into 2024, that collective fund has been used to build capacity and critical positions, such as paying for coordinators and construction managers in the long-term recovery groups. Um, paying for case managers to work with for, uh, flood survivors in parts of Vermont not covered or served by FEMA, working with partners to get work crews out to do building assessments and damage uh, uh, assessments of uh, damage to homes and other buildings, 
what, when it became clear that Vermont needed uh, better data to really respond uh, uh, more quickly and in a coordinated way to the, the building, the home repair and rebuilding challenges ahead of us, the Community Foundation used the fund to work together and partner with the state, with the long-term recovery groups, with the Vermont Disaster Recovery Fund, and with the Stormwise Foundation to create a new integrated data system that brings together all the information we have on the homes that were impacted, progress that has been made, and what is yet to be done. Now is not the time to slow down, step back, or, or look away. I hope that Vermonters and all those who love Vermont will join with the Community Foundation, the state, and our partners in recognizing that this is an important and very specific, powerful uh, window of opportunity in front of us right now. To learn uh, from what we experienced in 2023, from what we've seen with how federal dollars move, what they can cover, what they can't cover, um, and what it takes to set up the long-term recovery systems that we're going to need. Many of you are given locally uh, to towns and organizations near where you live or that are close to you in your heart, and that is so amazing and so important, and please keep doing that. Please also consider a donation to the Flood Response and Recovery Fund so that collectively, together, we can ensure that folks get the help they need, not just in your town, but in all the impacted towns. So we can ensure that all families that need to build back and get back into their homes or move forward are not left to chance or luck. And that together, we can build the systems for response, recovery, and resilience that we need both today and that we're going to need for many years forward. You can give into the fund and find out more about these strategies by going to VT for Vermont Flood Response.org. That's VT Flood Response.org. I'm going to turn it back to the governor. Thank you so much. Thank you, Holly. We'll open up to questions at this time. You may have no idea, but with the declaration not being approved yet, is there any specific hold, or is it just kind of the federal government taking time like they do sometimes? Yeah, I think it's just the normal process. We did reach out to the White House and uh, to see if there was anything that we should know and if there's anything in the way, and they said that they, uh, they reported back that we should hear something very soon. I think that's good news. But they did approve a declaration for the later round of flooding in July, didn't they? It's, um, it's a little bit more complicated, um, all the declarations and the state of emergencies and so forth, and there's separate ones and additions to. Um, Doug, can you explain what we've, what we've received, what we haven't at this point? Or I'm please, so, Governor. Um, Jason, please <laughs> fact check me, right? I believe that the only declaration that really has been approved at this point is the, emergen the emergency declaration related to Debbie. So that came through. That was in, in order to in place so that we could access federal resources quickly if we needed to. That was fortunately not necessary, and we were able to stand that down. The other declarations are all in, in various stages of the process, and so we don't have the formal public assistance or individual assistance declarations yet. So just to clarify, the one we're still waiting on, that's the one from the first storms that happened roughly a month ago, the first set that came through on July 10th. Again. There's a number in process. So we're waiting on remnants of Hurricane Barrel. That one is very close. That one is, you know, um, with, the, with the Biden administration, right? And we are hopeful that that will be crossing the finish line soon. Uh, prior to that, we had some localized flooding that impacted Stowe primarily. That in order to gather the data to support a declaration, um, we've had to ask for an extension to be able to make sure that we're hitting the thresholds there. The flooding from the 30th, that preliminary damage assessment work on the individual side was performed last week, and um, public assistance had already kind of uh, was under, was farther along and had crossed some significant thresholds there earlier before the individual. Individual assistance is generally harder thresholds to cross than public assistance. Um, I don't think I'm missing any of the other ones in flight. So those would be separate declarations for July 10th and July 30th? Yes, because of the way the Stafford Act is constructed, so it's not even, this is not even necessarily something that FEMA has decision making over. It's linked to what a storm system is classified by the National Weather Service. And 
with Beryl and then the, uh, the events on the 30th, those, those events, National Weather Service is not likely to classify as a single storm system. I'm probably getting a little too in the weeds here, but how when you're doing the damage assessments, can you even differentiate between damage from July 10th versus July 30th? Uh, that is a good question. It is extremely difficult. Um, and one thing that can help protect us and make sure is, is trying to document the damage as quickly as possible. However, in some cases, it's several days or longer before you can actually get to certain locations to document. So we do have to do the best job we can in, in categorizing the damage and linking it to a particular event. But you've highlighted one of the significant challenges with the current declaration system that, that FEMA is, um, by the Stafford Act, kind of locked into. I think it's a challenge of the structure. So by the time we're done, we should have three uh, declarations for the three different storms. Um, how sustainable is this flood response model that relies primarily on volunteer work? We're seeing flooding becoming more frequent and we're leaning on volunteers. So how long can this go on? Yeah, I mean, we're not totally relying on volunteers. We certainly need them, and they assist us in an in a amazing way. Uh, but, um, but we're using you know, state resources, uh, local resources, uh, and federal resources as well. So it's a combined effort. Uh, but, uh, but again, uh, I think there is some fatigue. And, um, but, but there are still a number of people who want to help. So uh, that's why we're advocating for people to sign up because there's still a lot of work to do. What has volunteer turnout looked like this year compared to last year? Um, again, I think it's different in different areas um, <clears throat> because the need has been, been greater or different. When we saw uh, last year in Montpelier, very well organized, um, there was a lot of effort there. Uh, they have reached out, I believe they've even reached out to Plainfield to see if they could assist uh, as well. Uh, Barry Up is doing uh, a lot of work there, but it hasn't been uh, as needed as it was a year ago. Uh, and at, in the Northeast Kingdom, uh, Lindenville in particular, is a lot of volunteers are just coming out to help out in any way they can. So it, it really is regionalized different for different areas, and the need is uh, different for for different geographical areas. This might be a better question for, say, the Department of Tourism, but last year after the big flooding, there were billboards in other states saying Vermont's open, Vermont's open. Do we have any idea maybe how the rain this past summer has affected summer tourism coming in this year? You know, there's a couple of um, things we're watching, obviously, um, and we'll, we'll see it in the numbers uh, when the revenues come in. Uh, but the um, state parks, for instance, uh, are up up over last year, uh, even at this point in time. And we had some uh, state parks who were impacted. They're all open right now, had to have some cancellations. Um, but um, just anecdotally, uh, when I went to, I think it was last week, when I went to uh, Lindenville and I was going up um, Red Village Road and taking the turn off from Route 5, there was, there was a line of traffic off from 91 uh, to get on to 5. Uh, that I hadn't seen as much traffic uh, in any time that I've been up there as I did then. A lot of out-of-state vehicles, people are still traveling um, and getting to their destination. So we'll see, um, and again, we'll, we'll know better um, when, we, when we see the revenue uh, numbers that come in from rooms and meals and things like that. Hey, good afternoon, Governor. I wonder about all the construction work that needs to be done. There's going to be, uh, there's money available. There's still the regular, you know, highway uh, funds, uh, those projects that are being um, lined up and uh, are ready to go or in process. How do you prioritize now with the, the new need? Um, and we're not even through finishing up on uh, uh, the July 2023 uh, construction construction projects. How do you prioritize all that, given the workforce limitations, the construction limitations, 
And do you have to even triage some projects? Yeah, we're, we're fortunate to have a, a number of quality contractors out there that have stepped up to assist. And I've been, um, I, I find it remarkable in some respects being in the business for as long as I have and knowing that you have a backlog of work uh, that they've been able to to come forward and uh, give us some relief and from all areas of Vermont. So uh, that, that other work, as you mentioned, still needs to be done. Um, life and safety obviously comes first, um, but uh, right now they seem to be managing the workload. But I'll let uh, Joe Flynn talk about um, the VTRANS projects. Thank you, Governor. <clears throat> Excuse me, Tim. Uh, for example, last year in 2023, we did have a few VTRANS projects that we extended by about six weeks so that those contractors could break off and go help towns. And we would have categorized those as um, lower profile. That doesn't mean they're not important, but <clears throat> they were projects that could be extended a little bit further into the fall. This year, we've not had to do that yet. And I hope we don't have to do that. Let's hope that these storms um, give us a bit of a break here. Um, but there were contractors who rose to the occasion for storm repair that also had other crews working on VTRANS projects but didn't have to pull them away. And I think one of the other questions you asked was how do we afford all this? Was that correct? Yeah, it seems like the, the money comes, comes in and maybe there's even a backload of well, our, our regular book of business is funded through the Federal Highway Administration, and currently we're still within the, uh, the 2JA uh, five-year tranche of authorization. Storm-related money to state infrastructure is funded through Federal Highway, but it comes from emergency relief money, which is a separate bucket. So just hypothetically, if we're at about $30 million on the state network, roads and bridges this far for 2024, that doesn't come out of the allocated funds for our normal book of business in this year. It comes from a different source. Do you, do you have to pull from out-of-state contractors at all, Joe? We do have, uh, in our regular book of business, we do have some companies that have out-of-state addresses, uh, but they're in Vermont a lot, so they almost seem like Vermont-based companies um, do good work for us. But we don't have to pull uniquely from out of state for storm recovery. Okay. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Lexi, Vermont Public. Uh, and then I think Commissioner Morrison, did you want to add anything um, on the FEMA declaration process? Sure, I'd be happy to. I just wanted to clarify that there's a difference between an emergency declaration, which is what we sought when we saw um, Tropical Storm Debbie approaching, and the emergency declaration allows us to access resources that help respond to the event. So out of state urban search and rescue teams with water teams, that type of thing. That is very different, and sometimes I think it's getting confused by, by uh, viewers or, or readers from receiving a major disaster declaration, which is the document that we are talking about coming back to us from the White House in the near future. <clears throat> and that is specific to the storm July 9 through 11, uh, known as Barrel. Those requests go in after a process of damage assessments and we believe we've met thresholds we ask the white house for a major disaster declaration that if it is approved is when things like funding for public assistance and individual assistance become available so i think people have gotten a little confused between the the, the coverage of an emergency declaration being made the night before barrel and a major disaster declaration which is something that comes well after a natural disaster and after you've started to do the inventory of damages and you've triggered thresholds and then you ask for this MDD. So I just wanted to clarify that so that um, we could reduce the amount of confusion in the general public. Although I will just say that the entire FEMA construct is very confusing. And then 
we'll go back to Lexi one more time. Lexi, it looks like you're unmuted, but we can't hear you, so I'll, um, I'll follow up with you after. Okay. Oh, before you hear you now. <laughs> go ahead, Lexi. Okay. Um, this is a question, I think, for Doug Barnum. I was just wondering if you could talk about the scale of the bridge case manager program. I'm wondering how many state employees might serve in those roles and for how long. Uh, thank you. Yes. So. The bridge case manager program, for comparison, we stood up a similar program in after the 2023 floods, and we had nine to 10 bridge case managers in place. Um, and really, the, the purpose there was to, to bridge until a disaster case management grant program that we'd worked with Capstone and other community action partners with uh, was able to hire people, train them, get them in place. Um, this time around, uh, based on a rough estimate of the number of households impacted. We have five bridge case managers in place. So we have, at a very macro level, we do expect there are fewer households impacted this year than last year. Uh, so we have five bridge case managers. We are planning to keep them in place until October 31st, and we're evaluating how we can uh, work with the long-term recovery groups in November and forward. Uh, you know, based on the timelines for the hazard mitigation grant program and other elements of recovery, a lot of households take one to two years really to work through the recovery process. So we do know that we, we need to work with them and figure out what the medium term looks like. So we're defining medium term in this case as after um, October. You know, disappointing in some respects uh, with a low turnout. Uh, Fifteen percent uh, is not something to be proud of, and I'm not sure that we got the the will of the people, so to speak. And I'm hoping in the general election that people are going to step up and do their civic duty and vote. Um, we hear a lot of complaints about what's happening in our state, and, and um, we need people to to vote change it if, if that's what their issue is. So you know, there's another opportunity in the general, but uh, I, was little, I was disappointed in the turnout. What about in the results? I mean, I know specifically we're really supporting Mr. Ledfeather and Jimmy Central and Elizabeth Brown and the yeah. Washington I think, uh, uh, again, I think turnout affected those races as well. Because when you, when you have a primary, and that's what I think some of my issues are with primaries, because it really attracts the party faithful, those, you know, the extremes of, of any party, uh, the ones who, who are most interested to show up to vote. So you don't really get, you get more polarization in some respects. You don't get the middle because the middle doesn't seem to come out and, and, and vote at those times. So again, uh, I, th I, think, I think the low turnout affected those races because they did pretty well in some respects, uh, came close, uh, but um, couldn't get over over the top. And again, I would just owe that to the party faithful. And so now I officially know Esther Charleston got the Democratic nomination will be going up against you this November. So I guess like for you, I mean, once again, in a poll just a couple weeks ago, you rated as the number one highest approved governor in the nation. So I guess what does November look like for you kind of this path going forward now over the next couple months? Well. You know, I don't think you'll see anything different uh, from me. Um, I've been fairly consistent about what I think our challenges are. I still believe affordability is an issue. Housing is an issue. Uh, protecting the most vulnerable. Uh, and, you know, the, the costs of, of living in the state. Um, all, those, all those challenges are still there. Uh, so I'll be talking about those. Uh, I'll be engaging with candidates that uh, are of the same minds, whether they're Republicans or Democrats, and, uh, and hopefully we can get more of them into office. And John Rogers, you endorsed one going up against David Zuckerman. I guess, are you planning to go around and campaign with Rogers at all? Because Zuckerman, when he wants to be, seems like he can be a pretty powerful force to get out of the lieutenant governor's seat. Yeah, yeah. No, I mean, he's got a lot of name recognition. Um, but, uh, but I would say that 
John Rogers is up to that. Uh, he's, uh, he's a force as well, and he is uh, not afraid to speak his mind. So it'll be a, it'll be a very engaging uh, contest, I believe. How do you foresee your involvement with the down-ballot races progressing as we get closer? Again, um, we will try and assist those of like minds, uh, those uh, centrist, moderate candidates of either, either party who uh, are trying to get elected, get their message out, and I'll, we'll assist in any way we can to get them elected. What will that look like? What, what is the... um, it might be different for different candidates. I just don't know at this point, but, um, but we're there to help. Thank you all.